From a and this is Biography. I have made a wonderful discovery. I find that alcohol taken persistently and in sufficiently large quantities produces all the effects of intoxication. He was funny. <laughs> he was the funniest man who ever lived. I mean, you know, how can you say anything more than that? <laughs> Oscar Wilde's writing made him famous, but his life was his true work of art. He kept dinner tables hanging on his every word. His plays ran to packed houses, Wilde brought color to the gray of Victorian England with both his words and his appearance. It opened the doors and windows on stuffy Victorianism and let in you know, a breath of, well, not exactly fresh air, but certainly very different air. And in a time when you could be thrown into jail for committing homosexual acts, Oscar Wilde defended himself against a prejudiced and hypocritical England. You're a little advance of your age. You always end up being burnt at the stake. Oscar Fingal O'Flaherty Wills Wilde made his debut in October 1854 two years after his brother Willie, and two and a half years before his sister, Isola. The family lived in a large home on Marion Square in Dublin. It was one of the most elegant houses on one of the most prestigious squares in the city. The household was headed by Sir William and Lady Jane Wilde, the two people who shaped Oscar's future more than anyone else. His father was one of those typical Victorian polymaths who knew about the history of his country, the superstitions, the archaeology. He was a, a very, very fine doctor in his own right, um, an ophthalmologist um, and an aurist, an ear and eye surgeon, basically, um, a great all-rounder. In the best tradition of the times, he was a copious drinker and an uncontrolled fornicator, apparently. He had three out-of-wedlock children and three in-wedlock children that we can trace. Lady Wilde was just as colorful. Before Oscar's birth, she had been deeply involved with the Irish nationalist movement. She wrote revolutionary poetry for an Irish newspaper under the name Speranza, Italian for hope. Speranza held grand salons at Marion Square. Dublin's best musicians, poets, and literary men, professors of medicine, of law, and classics, gathered each week for conversations with Lady Jane. She used to sail into her salon, she was six feet tall, dressed in mauve-colored shawls with uh, a black wig, a high headdress, covered with Celtic uh, jewelry, and hanging from parts of her body would be brooches with photographs of her relatives. She must have looked like a walking museum. She would say body things to shock people. Um, like Oscar, she believed that facts really shouldn't get in the way of a good story. So she taught Wilde that he could do pretty much anything he wanted to, and the truth really wasn't that important, particularly when you're trying to entertain people. Oscar picked up on the best of his mother's eccentricities, but he also learned from her guests, watching the parties quietly from the sidelines. Oscar and his older brother, Willie, were invited to take part in the salon, but not speak. So they learned to listen before they spoke. They trained their ears before they trained their mouths. Speranza Salon was Oscar's first classroom. His second was the elite English-style boarding school, Portora, where his parents sent him at age nine. Wilde excelled in his studies and was awarded a scholarship to Trinity College in Dublin, just down the block from his parents' home on Marion Square. He says to his friend, you must come home and meet my mother. We've founded a society for the suppression of virtue. <laughs> 
it certainly, uh, I think, demonstrates to us that he and his mother were very much in cahoots with one another, uh, trying, in a sense, both of them to, there were elements, I think, of trying to shock society already. But afternoons with Speranza didn't get in the way of his studies. Wilde left Trinity College in 1874 on another scholarship, this time to Oxford University. Wilde rounded out his education by dating girls, rowing crew, and cheering for cricket and football games. At six foot two, he made a formidable presence at the university. He was a tough guy. He was no blushing violet or, or sort of drooping pansy. He was big. He was a very proud nationalist Irishman. Those who met him didn't think, oh, here comes some, you know, Nancy boy. It was at Oxford that Wilde embraced the aesthetic movement, an attitude that the sheer beauty of objects would improve one's quality of life. Wilde adopted an aesthetic pose. He traded in his plaid wool suits for silk and velvet and grew his hair. He was formulating a life's philosophy that looked at himself as becoming a work of art. There was always something he was saying, that one should either become a work of art or wear a work of art. He filled his drab Oxford room with flowers, peacock feathers, and exquisite china. In awe of his surroundings, Oscar marveled to a friend, I find it harder every day to live up to my blue china. His famous and much recorded remark about his blue china was, I think, broadcast quite widely. And he was, it was certainly denounced in the university church by a preacher who said that this sort of heathenism needed to be stamped out. It smacked already of a slight decadence and something which wasn't quite uh, what the sort of English gentleman should be doing. Oscar added to his campus notoriety in 1878 when he placed first in his finals. Just before graduation, Wilde's close friends quizzed him on his next step. Oscar says, well, I'm not quite sure, but one thing I'm not going to be is a dried-up Oxford don. I'll be a poet, a writer, uh, a dramatist. Uh, I, I shall be famous, and if not famous, notorious. And somehow he managed to achieve it all in exactly that order. Uh, and it was a, almost a terrible premonition in the sense of what was going to happen. February 1879, Oscar Wilde moved to London, determined to sell himself as a professor of aesthetics. He moved in with a friend, Frank Miles, a well-known and well-connected portrait painter. And it was through Miles that the 25-year-old Wilde made contact with the highest rung of London's social ladder. He befriended the painter, James McNeil Whistler, and actress, Lily Langtree courted actress Ellen Terry with sonnets and threw white lilies at the feet of leading lady Sarah Bernhardt. Partly because of the aesthetic business, he becomes very well known. Um, the famous moment is um, one Englishman uh, turns from another and goes, there goes that bloody fool Oscar Wilde. And Oscar turns to his friend and says, it's extraordinary how quickly one becomes known in London. He was using the fact that people were calling him a bloody fool in order to go forward. To get into the best society nowadays, one has to either feed people, amuse people, or shock people. And that is all. A man who can dominate a London dinner table can dominate the world. When we all try and imagine what an evening with Oscar would have been like, it's rather maddening because very many of the accounts we have of what it was like simply say that they can't tell you what it was like but that he somehow managed to dominate and devastate and hypnotize and captivate every dinner table, every uh, circle he was in, and that he was always doing it. People all over London were talking about him. Even the Prince of Wales declared, not to know Mr. Wilde is not to be known. But not everyone was charmed. What has he done, this young man, that one meets him everywhere, asked Polish actress Helen Mojeska. 
Oh yes, he talks well, but what has he done? So in 1880, Oscar did do something. He wrote his first play, Vera or the Nihilists, but he couldn't get it produced. A year later, he self-published a book of 61 poems. While some enjoyed it, many criticized the work as thoroughly unoriginal. Oscar wasn't discouraged, as he would later write, There is only one thing in the world worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. I th think Oscar definitely had it figured out that celebrity should come first, rather than celebrity being the end of years of work. Punch magazine, one of the most popular in Britain, had a field day with Oscar, mocking his tepid poems. Esthete of esthetes, they wrote, what's in a name? The poet is wild, but his poetry's tame. Then, the sincerest form of flattery, satire. Gilbert and Sullivan's newest operetta, Patience, lampooned the aesthetic movement and was a great hit in England. When the show went to the U.S., producers hired Oscar Wilde to lecture Americans on aesthetics. At only 27, he boarded the SS Arizona and sailed for America. In January 1882, he arrived in New York City, where a customs official asked him if he had anything to declare. The only thing I have to declare is my genius. America was largely unprepared for what they were going to see. I think they expected a sort of limp-wristed, rather dandified young man, and they didn't expect a six-foot-two, well-built Irishman in a very large fur coat who was going to lecture them on the uh, English Renaissance in art. Most found Wilde's cloak and knee breeches more interesting than what he had to say. The New York Times called his lectures boring, monotonous, and wearisome. But after a few rewrites, Wilde was a hit. He was preaching the idea of beauty in house adornment, way of life, in furnishings and so forth. And he traveled all over the United States using the satire on himself as a means of evangelizing his aesthetic gospel. That's good salesmanship. My dear Norman, great success here. Nothing like it since Dickens, they tell me. I'm torn in bits by society. Immense receptions, wonderful dinners, crowds wait for my carriage. I wave a gloved hand and an ivory cane and they cheer. I have two secretaries, one to write my autograph, another whose hair is brown, to send locks of his own hair to the young ladies who write asking for mine. He is rapidly becoming bald. My dear Mrs. Beer, I don't know where I am, but I am among canyons and coyotes. One is a sort of fox, the other a deep ravine. I don't know which is which, but it does not really matter in the West. They have such a strong objection to literature that they always use different words for the same object every day. He drinks drink for drink with the miners and smokes cigarette for cigarette with them and more or less drinks them under the table. And they respect him enormously for it. Oscar Wilde may have come to America to teach the country about aesthetics, but America taught him something as well. He had an enormous admiration for America because essentially it swept away all the hypocrisy which was so prevalent in English society at the time. You just got on with what you wanted to get on with. Ambition was accepted, you made your way to the top of the social pile and you did it in the best way you could and you, you know, if it meant trampling on other people you did it. It was a lesson that Wilde took back to Europe with him when he left in December of 1882. His year-long visit to America had given him legitimacy as an artist and pockets full of money. And that was a wonderful thing for him because he was just sort of a man about town who had self-published a book of poems that had not been well received. And once he came back from America, I mean, he was an international figure. He was what he had set out to be, a celebrity. In 1883, Oscar Wilde arrived in Paris and put his aesthetic posing behind him. 
he replaced his knee breeches with the highest fashion of the day, a flower in the buttonhole of an impeccable suit, gold-tipped cigarettes in a polished silver case, white gloves and an elegant cane. At 28, Wilde declared, the Oscar of the first period is dead. He lounged about Paris visiting the A-list celebrities of the day, Emile Zola, Victor Hugo, Edgar Degas, and Camille Pizarro. And he spent some time writing The Duchess of Padua, a new play he promised for American actress Mary Anderson. She turns it down flat. This is, of course, a great disappointment. So he then goes back to London and he starts lecturing. And one of the new lectures that he puts into his repertoire is personal impressions of America. So he takes this round England and he also takes it over to Dublin and there he re-meets, it's not for the first time, my grandmother, Constance Lloyd. My dear Lil, I'm going to be married to a beautiful young girl named Constance Lloyd, a grave, slight violet-eyed little Artemis with great coils of heavy brown hair which make her flower-like head droop like a flower. We are to be married in April. It's very important, I think, that while it doesn't seem to have any sense of himself being, a homosex being homosexually inclined at the time when he was married. Once married, the couple moved into a home on Tite Street in London, where their first son, Cyril, was born in 1885, followed 17 months later by their second son, Vivian. By all accounts, Wilde was a devoted and fun-loving father who channeled his own childlike energy into playtime with his children. He built sandcastles with them. He got down on his knees and, you know, played trains and they rode on his back. And he was a real act of fun father. But by 1887, the once flamboyant Wild was bored with conventional Victorian family life. So at 32, he put himself back in the spotlight when he accepted a job as editor of the popular magazine, The Ladies' World. We should deal not merely with what women wear, but with what they think and what they feel. The ladies' world should be made the recognized organ for the expression of women's opinions on all subjects of literature, art, and modern life. Wilde changed the name of the magazine to The Woman's World and solicited articles from prominent women in London society. He was picking up a lot of the um, aspects of the magazines today celebrity sell magazines and it gave me opportunity to go to you know countess this and lady that and say will you you know would you write me a few words on whatever days at the office were followed by society dinners and parties without constance they'd had two children together whom oscar dearly loved but he would not and could not be the typical husband Oscar made some astounding statements to Frank Harris when his wife Constance, his long-suffering wife Constance, became pregnant. He said that uh, he, he had became physically revolted by her. He describes having to open the window and breathe fresh air and wipe her kiss off his mouth because the slim, beautiful body rather resembling a boy's, we think, that he once admired, became swollen and heavy and thick with pregnancy. He could not bear it. It was around this time that Wilde began tutoring a young Cambridge student named Robbie Ross. Ross would become Wilde's closest friend and confidant, and eventually the executor of his estate. But by most accounts, the two were more than just friends a relationship that started when Oscar eagerly caved to the seductions of his young suitor. As Wilde would later write, I can resist anything but temptation. It begins as an experiment, an experiment which he willingly goes into, he's attracted by, but it's very soon that he discovers that this isn't an experiment, this is for real and it opens up a totally new side to him of his own sexuality and of his own nature. He begins to lead, as he necessarily had to, this slightly double life. We really cannot define how much it meant to him 
to realise that it was his own sex for whom his um, preference was. Um, what is important, of course, is that he certainly was to use his homosexual consciousness in the development of some extremely interesting work. In 1890, Lippincott's magazine published The Picture of Dorian Gray. The story hinted at sin and decadence on every page, and its thinly veiled homosexual undertones shocked staid Victorian society. Protagonist Dorian Gray trades his soul for eternal youth, with each immoral deed, a portrait of him grows older and uglier, while he stays young. It was so scandalous to the Victorian public that it created uh, literally hundreds of column inches in the press of really very vituperative criticism. To him, the succès de scandale of having this first novel roundly criticised by virtually all the newspapers was, on the contrary, something which was absolutely marvellous. It, you know, it put him right in the forefront of British writing at the time. On the heels of Dorian Gray, Wilde published a flurry of essays and short stories that secured his reputation as a serious writer. But in just four short years, the society that had celebrated his public persona would persecute him for his private deeds. In 1891, 36-year-old Oscar Wilde fell in love with Lord Alfred Douglas, an Oxford student 16 years his junior. He was known affectionately by his family as Bosie. In some respects, Bosie Douglas was the incarnation of the fictional Dorian Gray. He was blonde and beautiful. An aristocrat and aspiring poet, Bosie had a destructive side, a mean streak, and an ability to draw people into his life. By his own account, he had read the picture of Dorian Gray between nine and 14 times. Once Wilde has met him, it's, the game's up. I mean, he'll never find anyone as gorgeous as this again. And he's prepared to make a fool of himself and to take colossal risks. My own boy, your sonnet is quite lovely. And it is a marvel that those red rose leaf lips of yours should have been made no less for music of song than for madness of kisses. Your slim gilt soul walks between passion and poetry. I know Hyacinthus, whom Apollo loved so madly, was you in Greek days. Their relationship started out giddy and passionate. Oscar lavished Bosey with gifts. They drank amber-colored champagne in the city's most elegant restaurants and spent weekends away at the best country inns. They went into a hotel in Brighton to have breakfast. The waiter said, uh, the kippers are very nice, uh, and Wilde replied flippantly, uh, we wouldn't say that if you knew their breeding habits. Um, it wasn't his best remark, as Bosie said, but what it did do was it led them into this sort of endless absurdities. Uh, they spent the rest of the day joking on all sorts of other things. They were the perfect foil for each other. Wilde spent more and more time living in London hotels with Bosie. He explained to his wife Constance that he needed the privacy to write, and she had little reason to doubt him. The early 1890s brought about the most productive time in Wilde's career. In February 1892, he opened Lady Windermere's Fan, the first of four critically acclaimed plays. A Woman of No Importance debuted a year later, followed in 1895 by An Ideal Husband and The Importance of Being Earnest. Each comedy mocked Victorian society, poking fun at London's social hierarchy and the masks worn by the upper crust. He was able to hold up rather a an elegant and well-polished mirror to the flaws and hypocrisies and minor vices of society. If you read Oscar Wilde, you feel, it makes the audience feel they're funny. You know, the audience feel they're rather clever and witty, which is, um, which is a great recipe for success. All of Wilde's plays have a certain pacing and timing that, that make them really extraordinary. Oscar's plays brought him great acclaim, 
and filled his pockets with what he referred to as bags of red and yellow gold. But the more money Wilde made, the more he spent. Within a short time, he was living off the credit of his name, moving deeper and deeper into debt. The only thing that can console one for having no money is extravagance. He was getting, at the height of an ideal husband and the importance of being earnest, the equivalent in today's money of about $10,000 a week, which was enormous. It was instant money which he needed to finance a disastrously extravagant lifestyle with Bosie Douglas. A few months into their relationship, young Lord Alfred Douglas introduced Wilde to London's homosexual underworld. As Bosie later wrote, it was he who unwittingly pushed Wilde over the precipice. They remained lovers in every platonic sense, but uh, they also, of course, um, hunted together for um, boys, passed boys on to each other, mainly lower class uh, boys, some rent boys, some uh, just stable lads, grooms, valets, that sort of thing. It was a dangerous game to play. Just a few years earlier, Parliament had passed the Criminal Law Amendment, making all sexual acts between men illegal and punishable by time in prison. But as Oscar Wilde later wrote, The danger was half the excitement. They were to me the brightest of gilded snakes. Their poison was part of their perfection. He says it's like feasting with panthers. And straight away, you, you get the idea that you were only that, you know, that far. They were a breath away from something wonderfully horrible happening to you. And yes, that's, that's the toxic and intoxicating element of it. It's never been put better, I don't think. The rush of excitement was addictive, and the passion of Oscar's secret life was only intensified by Bosey Douglas. Bosey threw nasty tantrums and repeatedly stormed out. Bosey! You must not make scenes with me. They kill me. They wreck the loveliness of life. I cannot see you so Greek and gracious, distorted by passion. I cannot listen to your curved lips saying hideous things to me. Don't do it. You break my heart. Oscar's tempestuous life with Bosey had little room for Constance and the children. Pierre Lou is um, a friend of... Um of Oscar Zambosi's, recorded going to the Savoy in 1892 or three. Constance came in and, and hadn't seen her husband for some time um, and asked why he hadn't been home. Her husband replied jokingly that he'd been away such a long time he couldn't remember where his house was. He has a sense that what he does is his own affair. This is the way I am. Do I have to conceal it? It was thumbing one's nose at the sense of, you know, British Victorian hypocrisy. He was always hiding it in plain sight, so that when he swept through the lobby of the album out club, surrounded by these boys to whom he had given cigarette cases inscribed for services rendered, it was pretty clear to people what he was doing. But as long as you didn't say it, you could still do it. But not everyone agreed. In 1893, Bosey's father, the Marquess of Queensbury, caught wind of his son's relationship with the flamboyant Wild, and he set out on a vicious campaign to end it. Queensbury was a brute, a belligerent man who had a history of beating his wife and ignoring his children. By all accounts, he was mentally unbalanced. Queensbury would follow Alfred Douglas and Oscar Wilde around London, threatening to dog rip him, thrash him. Bosey bought himself a pistol, uh, threatening to shoot his father if he saw him, and bought Oscar Wilde a sword stick to defend himself with. Father and son exchanged a barrage of nasty letters, and when Queensbury threatened not to open them, Bosey sent postcards, further enraging an already unstable man. I think Bosey, at this stage, does love Oscar very deeply. And he cannot stand the thought of his own father trying to dictate terms to him. I'll cut you off without a penny unless you break up your relationship with Oscar Wilde. And then Bosey threatens to buy a revolver and shoot him, you know. I mean, it is the behavior of a, of a completely unhinged family. The feud intensified in February.
In April 1895, 40-year-old Oscar Wilde sued the Marquess of Queensbury for criminal libel. Queensbury was defended by Edward Carson, whom Wilde knew from his time at Trinity College in Dublin. No doubt he will perform his task with the added bitterness of an old friend, Oscar remarked. In court, Wilde fended Carson off beautifully, putting on a performance as entertaining as anything he had written for the stage. Sir Edward Carson asked Wilde um, about his drinking habits, and Wilde said, You know, I drink iced champagne against my doctor's orders, and Carson said, Never mind your doctor's orders. And Wilde said, I never do. Laughter in court. Carson made a look a fool, face getting redder. Carson questioned Wilde about the morality of Dorian Gray and read aloud a love letter that Wilde had sent to Bosey. Is that an ordinary letter? Carson demanded to know. Everything I write is extraordinary, replied Wilde. He was unaware that Carson was leading him down a specific path. And it's the moment when Carson says about a young man at Oxford, did you kiss him? He said, no, I didn't kiss him. He was a particularly ugly boy, which he probably found it irresistible to say. But was one of those things, if you hear your client say it in court, your heart sinks to your boots. And then Carson goes straight for the jugular and says, is that the reason you didn't kiss him? And of course, by that stage, he's lost. That basically is the pivotal point in the whole trial. Laughter in the courtroom stops and Wilde soon learned that Queensberry had put together a solid defense. It was clear that the waiting room was full of rent boys who were, who were going to give evidence against Wilde. So the whole trial turned from being rather majestic entertainment to being a, a terrifying event, which he then dropped. Queensberry had won, and the libel trial was over. But evidence of Oscar Wilde's double life had been exposed. On April 5th, he was arrested and charged with gross indecency under the criminal law amendment. At the time of Oscar's arrest, his friend Ada Leverson said he was as famous, as well known as the Bank of England, though he was not nearly as solvent. He was the man of the moment. So his fall, when it came, was precipitous, instantaneous, and very, very frightening. Oscar's name was removed from playbills. He was shunned by London society. His belongings auctioned by creditors to satisfy the debt he and Bosey had amassed. He was made into a sort of public urinal where all the sort of bitterness and sexual frustration and double standards of the time could be vented on him. Wilde's friends, his wife Constance, and even Bosey urged him to flee England, but he ignored their advice. I decided it was nobler and more beautiful to stay. I did not want to be called a coward or a deserter. A false name, a disguise, a hunted life, all that is not for me. The government's trial against Oscar Wilde began on April 26, 1895. This time, Wilde's eloquence with language was no match for the prosecution's graphic evidence against him. Hotel workers testified to the parade of boys going in and out of Oscar's rooms, and soiled bedsheets were dragged into court. No longer is he the sort of gay blade and boulevardier who likes hanging out with exquisite young men. He looks like a slightly fat and slightly puffy guy who enjoys giving money to rather gruesome, dirty, sordid rent boys. We're in a slum and buggery is happening and people begin to recoil. Wilde's trial ended in a hung jury, but his retrial did not. On May 25th, Oscar Wilde was convicted of gross indecency. I shall, under such circumstances, said the judge, be expected to pass the severest sentence that the law allows. In my judgment, it is totally inadequate for a case as this. Wilde was sentenced to two years of hard labor in prison. At that point, when he was standing in the dock, when the man who'd, who'd had London in his palm was literally on his knees uh, and being, uh, being kicked when he was down by everyone, 
the change that came over him in the space of days is one that's impossible to fathom or, or understand fully. Oscar spent most of his prison time in a 10 by spent most of his prison time in a 10 by 13 foot cell at Reading Jail. There was no toilet, no writing materials, and nothing to read but the Bible. The intention was to make these prisons as unpleasant as possible. And that was done by working on every single one of the senses in an active and, in fact, very thoughtful way. You were kept on a diet which was designed to be enough to keep you alive, but not to make it worthwhile to live. Hunger went along with cold. You had to sit on a backless stool. This is a regime where a lot of attention has gone into making you feel really uncomfortable. Special arrangements were made for pen and paper, which Oscar used to write a long, angry letter to Bosey Douglas. The letter would later be published by Robbie Ross, Wilde's friend and former lover, under the title De Profundis. There is nothing that happened in those ill-starred years that I cannot recreate in that chamber of the brain which is set apart for grief or for despair. Every strained note of your voice, every twitch and gesture of your nervous hands, every bitter word, every poisonous phrase comes back to me. He had two years in which he had to meditate on what had happened. And so, uh, casting himself in the will of Christ, which he does in De Profundis, he goes out to find who his Judas was, and his Judas, in his eyes, was Alfred Douglas. On May 18, 1897, Oscar Wilde was released from prison with what his friends referred to as the dignity of a king returning from exile. He left that night for France under the pseudonym Sebastian Melmoth, taken from his great uncle's novel, Melmoth the Wanderer. His wife Constance had moved the children to Switzerland and reverted to the family name of Holland. She agreed to give Oscar 150 pounds a year on the grounds that he never see Bosey again, but postponed a face-to-face -face reunion. How could you possibly accept this man back in society who was a homosexual, who was a convict, and who was a bankrupt? You know, any one of those three things in Victorian times would have put you beyond the pale, and he was all three together. At 43, Oscar Wilde was a ruined man. He had very little money and very few friends. In desperation, he arranged a rendezvous in Naples with Bosey. When people speak against me for going back to Bosey, tell them, that he offered me love, and that in my loneliness and disgrace, I, after three months' struggle against a hideous Philistine world, turn naturally to him. Of course, I shall often be unhappy, but still I love him. The mere fact that he wrecked my life makes me love him. All hell breaks loose. Constance says, you've gone back to your filthy, insane life with Alfred Douglas, uh, takes his allowance away. There's no chance then of him seeing his children. And about four months later, Constance dies. Well, with her death, there's the last possible chance of him seeing his children simply taken away. Nobody's going to let him see his children now. After three months together, Oscar and Bosey parted ways. Alone again, Wilde moved to Paris. Once there, he used his prison cell number as a pseudonym, and in February 1898, published The Ballad of Reading Jail. For they starve the little frightened child till it weeps both night and day. And they scourge the weak and flog the fool and jibe the old and grey. And some grow mad and all grow bad and none a word may say. Each narrow cell in which we dwell is a foul and dark latrine. And the fetid breath of living death chokes up each grated screen. And all but lust is turned to dust in humanity's machine. For a short time, Wilde was an advocate for the reform of English prisons. But at 45, he had lost both his will to write and his only source of income. All he had to sell was his personality, and very few people were buying. In the middle of 1899, he writes a letter to a friend, 
and says, like St. Francis of Assisi, I'm wedded to poverty, but in my case the marriage is not a success. It's terrible, it's horrendous, it's the begging of money from friends, it's being without food for the evening because he's got not a sou left and he can't get credit anywhere. Those last letters are just heartbreaking. On October 10th, 1900, Wilde had an operation on his right ear, most likely to repair damage from an abscess he had suffered in prison. Friends visited him at the Hotel d'Alsace, where he was living. Over the course of the next month, his condition worsened. The wallpaper and I are fighting a duel to the death, Wilde remarked. On November 30th, 1900, Oscar Wilde died from cerebral meningitis. He was 46 years old. Bosie Douglas spent the rest of his life trying to come to terms with his past. He died in 1945, bankrupt and alone. In 1901, Robbie Ross salvaged Wilde's estate from bankruptcy and began a revival of his works. By 1920, Europeans were reading Oscar Wilde more than any English writer except Shakespeare. The man who had been crucified by society was once again celebrated. By the 1960s, he was being studied in universities and in the 1970s, hailed as a hero by the gay rights movement. A lot of what he was writing about then is as relevant today as it was back in the 1890s, which I think is really quite astounding. And for whatever his faults, you know, there were plenty of them, uh, you can't help forgiving, I think, a man who has made you laugh consistently for a hundred years. <laughs>